And good evening, church. I hope you're in a good mood. I hope you are full of joy. That would be an awful way to start, as we're going to talk about joy tonight, as if you came to us drab, but maybe you're ready to turn that around. So what brings you joy? Do you have a moment that you've thought about in time and throughout your history that you've thought, wow, that was, that was truly a joyous moment? Maybe it was a vacation. Maybe it was the birth of a child or a grandchild, or maybe it was some event that took place for you. Uh, you probably got a whole list of things that brought you joy. And in fact, you may be the kind of person who wakes up early, early in the morning and says, ah, oh, what a joyous day. And my recommendation is you should sleep longer. And it'll be a more joyous day. Just stay up late. Anyway, joy. Joy is one of those things that we have to have, and we need to realize it's okay. It's okay for us as Christians to feel joy. However, sometimes there is an idea and there's an aesthetic that exists because people believe that we should feel more like that as Christians, or we just aren't living for the Lord. That there should be some sort of heavy burden on us, and we should be solemn, and we should be stoic, and we should have these heavy, judgy eyes at everybody around us, and that that is real Christianity. I know that exists because I've seen that quite a bit. I bet you've seen it at some point as well. And I feel terrible that someone would feel that way. Knowing the Lord that we follow knowing the church that we get to be a part of, that in any way we would compromise the joy that God offers to us. It's very real. We have a joy from a biblical perspective that we should be taking uh, advantage of and living and understanding that it is good. It is great to be a Christian. Enjoy that Christianity. I have no greater joy, John writes in 3 John chapter 1, verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. John, the Apostle John, could see the faithfulness of the people that he had taught and the church that he cared so deeply about. And the fact that they were walking in faith brought him tremendous joy. That's something that we too can experience when we can see the faithfulness of the people around us. Let's share in that joy. We also see that in Luke chapter 6, there's a passage where he's talking about uh, the Beatitudes, and he says, now, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets." And James chapter 1, verse 2 says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. So the Bible is presenting to us the idea that just because whatever you're experiencing at this moment, at this time, isn't going the way that you want it to, it does not erase the joy that should exist and emanate from us as Christians, that is given to us by God. Because know this, our God is a God of joy. This passage here, Jude chapter 1, 24 and 25, says, Now to him who is able to keep you from uh, stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, his glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Our God is a God of joy joy. Even when Jesus gave the parable and he was sending them out with the talents and they came back and they had done really well, he said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And the fruits of the Spirit, you know I could not skip, skip the fruits of the spirits. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 gives this list, these qualities and these uh, aspects that we can see in God and love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Next verse says, against such there is no law. 
Understanding at the beginning of this that because of who our God is and the fact that we get to follow Him and we get to worship Him and we have that privilege and that honor and that blessing that comes from Him, there is no point where He says, stop your joy, Christians. Abound in it. As you abound in the Lord. Now that doesn't mean that there's not difficulties in life. So we're not making light of that. And that doesn't mean there's not challenges and turmoil because surely there was. Surely there was for our Lord when He walked the earth. And surely there is when each and every one of us is beset by sin. But we do not have to remain trapped by that. There's a freedom that comes from the Lord. We're allowed to enjoy our families in the Lord. We're allowed to enjoy our friendships in the Lord. We're allowed to go out and play, sometimes in the mud, in the Lord. There's some things that we should be doing. And that's not just for the kids. Older people should go play in the mud too sometimes. Sometimes. And some of you Friday night were enjoying all that snow. And you enjoyed that quite a bit. Some of you hated it, I know. But it's pretty amazing. The things that we get to exist and participate in throughout the world. We're going to spend some time in the book of Philippians tonight. So if you want to turn over to the book of Philippians, this is a powerful book um, because in every single chapter, there's a mention of joy and the need to rejoice. And it's a particularly interesting book that we're not going to be able to go super in depth in. And there's things I'm going to point to you that go study at this other point so that you can understand it, uh, give it its due. But we're going to look at several of these chapters in the book of Philippians, and we're going to see how Paul, who wrote the book of Philippians to the church in Philippi, how he responds and talks about and embraces joy as a Christian. And we're going to do it through at least three different ways. One, the circumstances that we encounter and how sometimes those challenge us and drain our joy out of us. The people that we surround ourselves with and how sometimes they drain the joy out of us. And finally, a degree of anxiety and depression and heavy things that may drain the joy out of us. God has given us, through the Holy Spirit and the writing of Paul, He's given us a tremendous book in Philippians that helps us navigate through those things and see that we're not trapped by the circumstances, by our people around us, and by the anxieties we have. We can press through that in the Lord. So Philippians chapter 1, Circumstances circumstances. There are circumstances that exist that have the opportunity, if we give it to them, to drain our joy. You may have concerns about world leaders and what they may do. It's not predictable. They seem driven instead by what would be greater for mankind, by what would be greater for themselves. And if people have to suffer in the midst of that, so be it. Let them serve their egos with their power. And that may bring us some concern and worry. We may be concerned and worried about the circumstances of the economics of the world. It seems like it's up and then it's down. And what about my retirement? And, and what about my future? And what about my job? And can I feed my family? These are valid concerns that we have. We may be concerned about unexpected events like the weather or your health and the destruction that that can tear through a family. And we would never make light of that ever. Those are circumstances that sometimes are beyond our control that may affect our joy. It could be something like a car crash. When your first car crashes, this was not my first car. Maybe it was a matchbox car. I don't know, but I'd like that car. But there's some things that you simply cannot control, and it's a circumstance. How do you deal with the joy through that? Paul's certainly a person who could talk about that. He had been through numerous circumstances, dire circumstances. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28, he begins to list some of those circumstances. And it is, it is terrible things he was going through. He was given stripes beaten by a whip because he was a Christian and would preach Christ. He was thrown in prison. He was threatened with death. Three times he was beaten with a rod. He was stoned with large stones brought up and slammed down against him because he was a Christian. He was shipwrecked three times. He, night and day he was in the deep. That may not sound too terrifying. In the old world, the deep, the ocean, was one of the most terrifying, unpredictable things that they would talk about. You see that in their mythologies and in their stories, that there was a tremendous fear with the deep. And so when he would write about being night and day in the deep, 
this carried a heavy, heavy burden, and people would shudder at the thought. Doesn't stop there. There was perils with robbers. There was perils with his countrymen. He hungered. He thirsted. He was fasting. He was cold. He was naked. And beyond all of that, which were things that were physical burdens on his body, he held within him a deep, deep concern for the church as there were false teachers that were working against it. There were people caught up with selfish ambitions that were working against it. There were entire government forces that were set against the church. And those were circumstances that many times were beyond his control. But despite that, he found joy. He found joy in the midst of all of the dark. In chapter 1 of the book of Philippians, we know that Paul is in prison. Uh, He had been in prison several times, and this is one in which he is trapped. He is restricted, and not because he had committed some great crime, but because he was preaching the gospel. And even still, he says this in verse 12, but I want you to know, brethren, that the the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having been confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He's saying, yeah, there's some problems going on, and my circumstance is pretty awful right now, but guess what? Here's the good news about this. The palace guards know that this is about Jesus. Man, that's something that's really good. And the other people that are around know that I'm in here because of Jesus. And that I'm willing to stick by Jesus. And I'm not going to fold and I'm not going to bend and let that be a testimony to even them, the pagans, the heathens, and let them know Jesus. He goes on to say that the other people around the Christians who are preaching Jesus, it has emboldened them so that they would carry the word throughout the world with even greater courage, and it did not stunt their efforts, but it caused them to drive on, and let's rejoice in that for sure. He goes on to say in the next few verses that, of course, there's some people that are preaching because of selfish ambition, and still there's some people that are doing it because they truly love Jesus, but this is the deal. In verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. His circumstances, that's that's an issue over here at the side. This was not the summation of his life. This did not define who he was. Christ defined who he was. His hope, his purpose, his measure of how he viewed his life was in Christ. And so whatever the circumstance was, He could find joy as he was serving and giving to Christ. Verse 19, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectations and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. That was the summation of his life, Christ. And if that's the summation of your life, how could you not have joy? You cannot be trapped and withheld from your joy because of your circumstances. Christ is greater than your circumstances. The freedom that you have in Christ is far greater than the turmoils around you pressed through with that sort of joy. He wasn't trapped. He was free. He was free to look through the circumstances and see the hope, the peace, the joy that comes through Christ. To cheer on the people who were bold enough to preach Christ and not stand down because of whoever might arrest them or even the threat of death. There was victory to be held in Christ. Christ cannot be broken. Christ cannot be torn down because He is our God. He is our advocate. He is our intercessor. He is our mediator. He is our Savior. He is our King. Let us boldly proclaim Him 
whether in chains, whether in victory in our homes, no matter the circumstance, even on the verge of our passing, let us praise Jesus and find joy in that. Oh, Paul's already set us up for a very powerful first chapter and book. Be joyous, Christians, because Jesus, Jesus is the cause of your life. He moves on to that second thing in chapter 2, which would be people. Now, you know how this goes with people. Sometimes there's people in your life that as soon as they walk in the room, there's a drain. You can feel it. Ooh, it drops down. It just drops down, and everyone knows it's there. You're looking around. You're like, oh, they're here. It's about to happen. Here's where it begins. You feel it. Not going to name names. Please don't name names. We don't have to. We don't want to. There's other people, and on this one you can name names, that when they walk in the room, it also changes the room, doesn't it? Everyone lightens up. Everyone lifts up a little bit. They bring joy to the room, something good. I was really amazed by watching this because sometimes this happens with Christians, and they can go in either one of those two categories, and a Christian, and it should never happen. As a Christian, you should be the light shining in that room. You really should, not because of you, but because of Christ. Let's work on making that happen. But I was watching someone who doesn't even bother um, with Christianity, and someone you don't ever hear talk about it, but there was a TV show, it's called Carpool Karaoke, have you seen it? Which people get in a car together, and the, the host, James Corden, drives around, and he sings songs uh, like many of us do, except he's filming himself doing it, and the rest of us are like, please don't watch me do this. And he gets a celebrity singer in there, and they sing songs together. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them are not so good. But there was a really amazing one with Paul McCartney. And the amazing thing about Paul McCartney to watch wasn't just that, wow, that's a Beatle. That's amazing. It was to watch him get out of the car and see the way that all the people reacted to Paul McCartney. It wasn't just the, oh my goodness, that's a celebrity, it's Paul McCartney. No, no, it was far beyond all that. Their entire demeanor shifted. You saw their eyes light up, and it was like he was emanating just waves and waves of joy because it hit everybody. And there would be crowds of people, and they're like, there's Paul McCartney. Oh my goodness, there's Paul McCartney. And then he would just say hi to them, and they were like, wow, Paul, thank you so much. And part of what was going on is they have such a connection to his songs that they were remembering all the moments that those songs are attached to. And he is just such a giving person and such a happy person that it could not help but affect them. That's Paul McCartney. It was pretty powerful to watch people just dive into that moment with him. It's not the same thing that happened when, say, Marilyn Manson or Kanye comes into the room. This was Paul McCartney. Happiness. Happiness. We need to be those kinds of people. Happiness and joy because of Jesus. But we know the people that aren't. And I hope more than that, we aren't the people that drain the room for sure. Paul here talks in verse 15 about a crooked and perverse generation. And we can talk, yeah, 2,000 years ago, there was a crooked and perverse generation that existed in Rome and in Philippi and in Corinth and Ephesus and all these cities of the Bible, for sure it did. And there were hideous sins that were committed, and there were people working against Christ instead of for Him. But we can also see how that exists today as well, a crooked and perverse generation. The things that we see happening and unfolding in our world sometimes are pretty shocking. And sometimes we wonder, wow, wow, could it get any worse? I got to tell you, I think it was worse way back in Noah's day. I really do. And I don't want to get any closer to it. But we cannot let that drain us of the joy we have in Jesus. And so Paul talks about this a little bit as he's, he's talking around this verse of, of, about the uh, perverse and uh, crooked and perverse generation. So if you look over in verse 14 and 15, you'll see some things that he's telling the Christians that you should be in the midst of all of this. And it's pretty powerful. He says that here's some qualities I want you to practice. Do all things without complaining or disputing in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Understand, that's the context he's talking about here. Don't complain, and don't get involved in disputes. Waste of time. There's no joy in that. 
It'll bring you down. He says, you should become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you should shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So, yeah. Don't get caught up in the crooked and perverse generation and don't dispute with them and complain about them and be caught and chase that negativeness that comes down there. You will find no joy in that and you will not bring joy to the world for that. You won't turn it that way. Be blameless. Be harmless in that situation and proclaim Christ. That's our mission and that's our job. Uphold what is good and live righteously. That's what we're called to do. Be children of God without fault. Be lights that shine among the world. That's what we're called to be. When we walk into a room, be that light. You matter and you are necessary to emanate that joy to the people around you. Show them Jesus Christ. Show them what they've never seen before. You can shine brighter than even, yes, Paul McCartney. As great as he is, you can shine brighter because Jesus is greater. And he points us in that direction because he starts giving us these examples of people to pay attention to. And he starts, of course, with Jesus in verses 5 through 8. And he starts describing this mind of Jesus. I'm going to back up to verse 1 and then lead into it. But he's causing for a shift in the way that we think and approach things. And it's pretty challenging. He says, therefore, in verse 1, if there is any uh, consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any infection, uh, infection of mercy, fulfill my joy there's the joy, by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Just put that out of your life. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interest of others. And that's got to extend far even to the crooked and perverse generation. Give them something. Give them Jesus. Because I want them to no longer be the crooked and perverse generation, but to be the repentant people, the humble people, the broken people that we all were and come to know Jesus Christ. So give them that. And then have this mind in you, he says. He goes on to say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus came bringing joy and freedom and giving because he was a servant. So let's start there. Let's have that mind. Not thinking of ourselves first, but looking out for others, looking out for the interests of others like Christ did by coming to earth and giving and giving and giving so that people could come to see God. And he did so as a servant. So grateful for what Alan said this morning about being a servant and differentiating the ideas of what really being a servant is as opposed to a person who's just kind of there. Being a servant means you're invested. It means you're committed. It means you don't just walk away from it. You're doing it for a cause that matters. Jesus came for a cause that matters to God, the Godhead, which was our salvation, which was our freedom. He wasn't just a volunteer in a temporary situation. He was someone who said, I am committed, even to the point of the cross, even to the point of death. He was a servant. Being a servant matters. And understanding that even though we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, let us serve to draw people to Christ. More so to the crooked and perverse generation, let us be servants to one another, lifting each other up. Understanding that when we come together as a church and as a group of Christians, it is a beautiful thing that should be cherished. And it's something that's so necessary for us to look out for one another and to put aside the entire idea to say those people are here for me, but more so, 
I am here for them. When it comes to teaching, let me be committed to the students in the class. And whatever capacity or ability I have, let that be the case. If it comes to cleaning up in the kitchen, let me serve. Let me get my hands dirty and let me get in there in the messiest situation. Not a one of us can say that we are too good for any of that. We're servants and we do it for Christ and we do it for one another. If there's a moment where we need someone to step up and take charge of something, please, please do so because we're servants for a cause higher than ourselves. We do it for Christ. Let's not do it with complaining. Let's not do it in any way that would be Speaking of the crooked and perverse generation, let's do it as Christians, pressing forward to something that brings joy in our own lives and the people around us. It's got to be something truly special, or they wouldn't be talking about it with the emphasis and passion that they are in the circumstances that they are. Let that be the case. But he doesn't just stop with Jesus. He goes on. Of course he's going to talk about Timothy because Timothy was so close to him. Timothy was also a servant. And Timothy, someone he describes down in verse 22, that you know his proven character. They should receive Timothy because of his proven character. Let us be people with proven characters, tested and found to be true, faithful to God with proven characters. Let us esteem a good reputation in Christ like Timothy pointing back to Jesus. And of course he talks about Epaphroditus. You cannot deeply go into the book of Philippians without looking at Epaphroditus. I wish we had more time to spend on him, and I'm going to challenge you to spend time looking at Epaphroditus and see his connections to the church at Philippi and Paul and the sacrifices that he made and his willingness to serve Jesus. It's pretty astounding. Paul describes him as a messenger and someone who brought the messenger, but someone who was also willing to serve, even when it almost cost him his life. Jesus, Timothy, and Epaphroditus were upheld as people who brought joy because of their dedication. We see God in Jesus, but also fully man. But Timothy and Epaphroditus as examples who also participated in servanthood, giving of themselves to others. If you think it's all your own strength, you will be depleted at some point. But when you realize that what you give is from Jesus, the fountain who does not end, you cannot be depleted because he cannot be depleted. So give and serve and do so generously. There's joy in that. We're going to move on to chapter four. Chapter three, look at when you get the chance. And I want you to think about it, how the standards of the world can be draining to us. Sometimes we feel that we're locked in, that we just can't meet the almost impossible standards of the world. Look at chapter 3 through that, and see how Paul talks about these are not our concerns. Sacrifice those things. He had a name. He had a position. He had responsibilities. Sacrifice those things for the cause of Christ. Because as he points out, and I think it's verse 20 of chapter 3, our citizenship is in heaven. Focus on the standards of heaven. They supersede the standards of the world. Chapter 4 we'll move into, and he talks about one last thing that we're going to focus on tonight, which would be the anxiety the anxiousness that we have. And this is a real thing that we should be talking about because it's something that plagues our country and many others. I read recently, this is the newest data that we had from the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, They said that 44.7 million adults live with mental illnesses. Now, this goes across the gamut. This could be obsessive compulsive disorder. This could be a, a bout of depression. It could be a very deep depression to a whole host of other mental disorders. And the point of bringing this up is that, great, we are now able to identify these easier, and we should be taking responsibility for these things, and people should not be shamed because of any of these sort of things. There should be no stigma attached to that. But it's a real issue. It's on the rise, and people are trying to look for ways to cope and to deal with anxieties. Worse and scarier is the fact that there's an upward trend in uh, teenage depression and, and anxiety disorders. You can chart that in the current generation compared to the previous generation. A sharp increase of almost 20%. That's pretty stunning. And there's reasons for that, and they're complex and intertwined and such, but it's terrifying because there's also been an upward trend in self-harm and suicide, especially in teenage girls in this particular generation. Kind of terrifying. 
So let's be thankful for people who dedicate themselves to that, your psychiatrists and therapists, people who develop medications to help, and we would never, never point against that sort of thing. But what we do want to talk about is starting with God and realize that God is the place we should always start. When those sort of negative emotions build up inside of us, when the anxieties build up into us, the depression builds up into us, we should start with God. Chapter 4 really talks about that uh, quite a bit. And he says it just a few short verses. Starting in verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And if you're a person that is struggling with mental illness or you have these sort of anxieties, even for a short term or long term, focus on these verses for a second. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. With thanksgiving, go to God first. That's not to say you don't go to your doctor and you don't talk to a therapist or any of that sort of thing, but start with God. Lean on God with thanksgiving. We have to remember constantly the tremendous things that God has done for us, is doing for us, will do for us. We cannot let these sort of things tear at us because the anxieties and depressions will want to do that and make us see hopelessness, even though hope is always there in Jesus Christ. Part of the problem with anxiety and depression and those sort of things is that it tries to put the burden of tomorrow on our shoulders as if we have any control over the burden of tomorrow. We can make some choices to navigate through, of course, and we should, but God carries the burden of tomorrow. God knows tomorrow. God's strength extends far beyond tomorrow, and He is there in a gentle way, in a loving way, in a caring way to lift us up. He can lift us up no matter how heavy that anxiety and depression feels upon us, so we start with God in thanksgiving. Romans chapter 1, verse 21, they forgot the thanksgiving that they should have towards God. It says, because although they knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Because they forgot God, and how they should hold Him up. So the challenge of chapter 4 is to always keep God in the highest place. And no matter how dark things look, we hold to Him as tightly as we possibly can. And even when it starts feeling like we're slipping a little bit, we've got to call out to help from other people. Please hold me up. Please lift me up. Knowing God is always there, and your church family is always there as well. Those are never things to ever be ashamed of. But when you need help, ask for help. Know that God is certain. He is sure, and there's hope and peace through that, no matter how dark it looks. The peace of God, it says in verse 7, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. This is the character and nature of God. It cannot be stopped. It is the capability of God. It cannot be stopped. More than our intellects, more than our wisdom, and more than our emotion, it cannot be stopped. It is our solution. God is able, and we cannot forget that. So I hope you think about joy, and I hope you come out of here today, even though we just ended on a very dark note, we're going to turn that around, look at the bright colors, and remember, we're Christians. Man, we are Christians and as you go to school tomorrow, carry Jesus with you and enjoy that day. As you go to work tomorrow, carry Jesus with you and shine bright. No matter the circumstance or the people or the anxieties that you're wrestling with, look for that joy. And if people seem down, lift them up. If you have any temptation to push someone down, just stop yourself immediately and find something good to say. Press forward for joy that's found in God, in Jesus, and in the Spirit, grounded in the Word, and you will have a life that is so special that God wants you to have that is truly amazing and will let us shine.
It's going to be a tremendous year. You are a tremendous group of people. I cannot wait for what's going to happen for the future of this congregation in 2019. Let's do it with joy in Christ. If there's anything we can do to help you, anything you're going through, circumstances seem too big, people seem out of control, anxieties and mental disorders taking over, man, we love you. We care about you. If we can't help you, we will do our best to get you there. But know that God, oh, He truly loves you. If there's anything we can do to help you, come forward as we stand and as we sing.